Best, most exciting prop bet or most like unique bet. I mean, I, I, you mentioned to me the one about the man who got implants for a year. I don't know if anyone's heard that true story. The guy got 100K, had to leave it in for one year. He ended up keeping him. He still has him, right? That was like yep, kind of he crazy. He never let go. He never let go. Uh, tell tell some of us. What, uh, I'll pay you 100 to get boobs for a year. 100 yeah. grand you'd offer me to put in implants? Sure. What, On the uh, table. What about uh, what what size? C's. C cups for yeah, one year. I can one take one for 100 yeah. G's. 100 K on the table. That was 100 K back then. That's probably it's probably more nowadays. I don't. I honestly I, that doesn't. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I don't. I don't want that on my hands. But can I'm we sure mention the other some... the other one I've offered you uh, for the naming? Oh yeah, you could mention it. Put it out there. See what people think. Go ahead. I offered PBF a price to name his child after me. So not Antonio though. <laughs> my real name is Amir. I was born Amir. So if he wants to name his son Amir, there's a price. Uh, Amelia, we're gonna talk about it. I, <laughs> I don't. I mean, it's. I don't know. I, I don't think it's happening, but it's it's there. Um, it's more than the boobs. What? Yeah, more. It's six. It's in the six figure club. It, it's worth <laughs> considering strongly. Uh, he has uh, a boxing match against a buddy of his who happens to be Kevin Hart, which is exciting because I know he would love to hit you, right? Like in a in a in a in an arena, he's gonna get a chance. You guys have battled. Yeah, he always and, jokes about how he can legally. Yeah, beat take, up. A, take a take a swing at you. So that that'll be fun. And who's the favorite right now in that? Well, he laid me thirty five to one. So wow. I'm assuming he's probably the favorite. And yes, he's a favorite. He's very fast. He's very strong. And he's quick as hell. And, I mean, have you ever seen a Persian guy in a boxing match? No, no, I have not. And 35 not to 1, really that's roulette. Sport. That's like putting a number and hitting on a roulette wheel. 35 to 1, exactly. So it's a long shot. Maybe it's closer yeah, I now. Mean, I, 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 I mean, if you ask me honestly, do I want to get in a ring with this guy? Of course not. But I can't pass down, a, I can't turn down a good bet. And that's really why I took this bet, because I was getting 35 to 1. And I'm just thinking, wow, I have to, 1 in 35 times, get lucky and win this fight. Plus, it's a good reason to get in really good shape. I mean, I've always been in decent shape, but this gave me the motivation to really go after it. Yeah, you're uh, 40 years old, and how has that changed? Do you feel, a no was there a noticing time where your body, or you feel like you've slowed down a little? I mean, is it harder? Because you always you eat really well, you you stay healthy, but could you feel your age, like at a certain age? I feel age great. I mean, I do feel 40 when I wake up in the morning, and I'm a little bit slower to move and get out of bed, but honestly, I feel better than I've ever felt. Burning Man is special to me. Um, we went eight years ago, m myself and two of my dearest friends, uh, and it was just the three of us in an RV. And that has grown to what we have today, which is a, a beautiful camp of about 150 people. And it's just a community of friendship and love. And it's just a, for me, it's a, it's a great place to go and kind of reset. You know, when I go to Burning Man, I feel like I get to actually disconnect from my life and all my responsibilities and all my work commitments and everything. Try and put my phone away. I check it maybe once a day if I can. Um, obviously to check in with my family and whatnot. Um, and it's a place where everybody's on the same platform, right? So whether you're worth 100 million or you're dead broke, you're the same person for eight days. And that's pretty special. You don't get that anywhere else in the world. So when there's no ulterior motives for people to hang out and just be who they are, it changes the playing field as far as social dynamics go. No one's trying to move up the social ladder. And everybody's extremely present because nobody really has their phone. And everybody's in costume. And it's just, it's probably the most, not probably, it is the most incredible place I've ever been to. And I highly recommend anyone that can go to go and experience it. And you talk to a lot of people that go to Burning Man and they are so so ecstatic and you can see the joy that they give by talking about it th that they get and you can only feel it if you go so i mean you've been don't you think it's a pretty special place? yeah i was just i was just getting ready not to say, just because you met your now baby wife mama, with, you know? yeah baby on the way you know i come from a very typical well i wouldn't say typical but iranian family right and so in my culture it's just so different than in the states you have to go to college. You have to either be a lawyer, dentist, or a doctor. And that's pretty much it. Or real estate. And so I obviously didn't go to college. I started, but I was doing magic, and I was kind of into it, and I wanted to create my own path. Yeah. And after doing magic for a year or so, uh, I thought I was going to be the next David Copperfield until I discovered poker. So all of a sudden, I have to go back to my father and say, hey, I think I'm going to actually gamble for a living. And so wasn't the best time he didn't really understand um, but to my surprise I did invite him to watch me play 
one time at the Bay 101 in San Jose. And he came and sat behind me, and I was so on point that day. We were playing a spread limit game where you could bet anywhere from 20 to 200 on any given street. And I realized the winning formula was just to play really tight because of the spread. And I had pretty much nailed how everybody played, the tight players, the loose players, whatnot. And so that day I told my dad what people had before they turned their cards over, and I swear I was right nine out of ten times. Rounder scene. And he couldn't believe it. He, he, he looked at me like, how do you know what they have? And I'm like, Dad, this. And I kind of tried to break it down for him. And before I ever had any success in the WPT or anything like that, he was like, son, you have my support. And That's huge. That's a yeah, big it was, one. Yeah, it was big. It was huge. That's awesome. Because he it. understood before it went prime. Like you said, you wouldn't recommend people necessarily quit their day job and be poker players. Is there any times, trials, tribulations that you've had where, was there times where you were looking at other something to segue out? Did you ever think, man, this is a little crazy? Was there ever a low point where you've had some, you know, people think on you, other people help me talk about going broke famously? Like, was it, did you basically start, hit that score with the kid 44 and uh, have a little roll going and kind of never look back? Or did you ever kind of go bust or any kind of uh, adversity stories early on? Fortunately and luckily, I'm, I never went broke after I hit that um, I do remember the night before that tournament I, my net worth was about 60k I lost 30 of it in one game the cash game there. in a cash game the night before the WPT started and the next day I, I punkered down 10k so now I'm down to 20 wait you put hold on you had you put a third of your whole bank that's correct you had that you had an entire piece of yourself in the in the 10k to start yes and then when I was Deeper. I had a couple little swaps like small and swaps things. and pieces okay. Um, and then Gustavo Jakobinson, uh, Gus Hansen. Oh, interesting. I never heard him call that. Yeah. Um, so Phil Locke calls him Gustavo Jakobinson. That's so I always call him Gustavo Jakobinson. I like that name. I, I love that. Gustavo. He's one of my favorite people. Although he's always trying to hit on my wife, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> he, um, so I, put, I, I punkered down another 10K um, to play that tournament, and then I won it. Which was nice. So then, and then after that, it was kind of hard to go broke. But about four or five years after that, six years after that, I started thinking, well, maybe I should look into something else because I haven't done anything in a tournament for a long time. But I was out raging every night. I mean, my life was a party. So, so it's you kinda, moved from LA to Vegas then? I never lived it. in LA before. Okay, I lived you were, in Northern California. Okay, yeah. You moved yeah, to yeah, Vegas. Yeah, and then you moved to Vegas. Moved to Vegas. And then. You took a while. You were a late bloomer for partying. You you didn't really party in your twenties much, right? Yeah, I mean, my late twenties I kind of started. I won the tournament and then I kind of got introduced to partying. And then about twenty seven, twenty eight, I really turned it on for about five years. And yeah, then had a good and then time. all of a sudden I woke up and I'm like, wow, I haven't won a tournament in so long. All I do is go out every night. Maybe I should do something else with my life. And then I kind of stuck with the poker. And then I won that tournament on my birthday. And then things started to happen. Someone asked, would you ever take a bullet again? I believe Dan Bilzerian shot you in his home with a gun. You're wearing a bullet vest, story. which is insane. I've seen the, the video. It's somewhere on the internet, I'm sure. Bilzerian's here right now. I don't know if there's a gun on the island, but we could, I mean, would you now, do that again? No. No. Now I have kids. I'm dude, that's honestly, way more or less dude, it's cr risk averse. I, I, did you way do that more. just to, you, there was no bet or anything? You just did it? No, what happened is I went to Dan's house and he was having a party and there was a film crew. This was uh, probably like 2011 or 10. In that zone. Back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I remember he had a bulletproof vest on the ground and he was shooting, he's about to shoot it. And I thought to myself, what a waste. Why not put the bulletproof vest on and shoot it? And so I thought it was a good idea at the time. Insane, man. It's literally <laughs> insane. The show with the great Phil Locke. Respect the man, the myth, the legend. He is. Now, he is the man, the he myth, is the legend. He is absolutely. He's going to be on the podcast. Don't panic, guys. I promise you will have him. Um, tell me uh, a little bit about your experience with that show, I Bet You. How did that come up? How did, like, because, like, if you have an idea, you're known for prop betting. You've done some crazy stuff. I mean, we between the two of us, we've been involved or known or had parts in some of the more, I think, epic gambling stories or, or bets of all time. Uh, what would you say? Like, how did that actually happen? Because you guys are betting stuff. How do you then get a TV show? A guy named happen? Crispin came up with the idea. Somehow it got pitched to a production company who called us and said, hey, we want to pitch this show. Can you guys come to New York and film like a half a day? We're just going to go and do some stuff on the streets of New York. We're like, sure. Um, went, did the filming, think for sure nothing is ever going to come of it. Then some time goes by, I think a few months, maybe four or five, six months. And we get a call, hey guys, we got, we got picked up, you guys want to do this? And our manager negotiated a deal with this production company. 
And next thing you know, we were out filming I Bet You, and it was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. It was awesome. We used to just walk around and bet on the stupidest things with cameras following us around. I mean, it was just like two degenerate gamblers, dreams come true. I miss those days. I remember.